Okay. Please proceed, uh, David. Okay. Can you share your screen? Hi. Uh, yeah, there we go. There we go. Perfect. So, yeah, thank you. So, thank you once again for the the, for the opportunity to speak here. And um, so, this time we'll um, uh, I'll quickly just remind uh, remind us of what we did, and then uh, go on to um, the new material. So, remember before we we were discussing discrete approximations of real and piatic uh, diffusion, um, real and piatic Brownian motion, and um, we discussed how one comes up with diffusion in the first place. And we discussed a little bit about what this is like in the um, uh, piatic case um, and what the, uh, discussed a diffusion that was driven by a Vladimirov operator. And so now we'll talk about its uh, finite approximation. Um, and once again, um, please um, ask questions at any time, interrupt at any time. Um, it's, 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 I actually really like that. Um, so if, whenever you have questions um, please, or comments or corrections, um, um, please just uh, talk, you know, ask or, or, or discuss. Um, so <clears throat> can everyone read the uh, first slide here? This yes. Is, this is, okay, great, great. Um, so remember that in the in the real case, the microscopic motion um, associated uh, associated to diffusion arises from collisions, from microscopic collisions, and the collisions can be modeled by discrete time random walks that approximate the diffusion process. And the QP setting is actually strikingly is, is very is strikingly analogous. So I want to um, um, uh, discuss how this uh, how we get such things. Uh, so let's denote by F. And field F either R or QP. Now it doesn't have to be. I, I was tempted to correct to change this. And in general, this framework, um, the paper is just for F being uh, QP, the field being QP. Um, but uh, the the techniques and the ideas should work. Um, and the reason why I set it up this this framework up this way is so that it would work not just for any F, but it would work for a vector space over F. So um, we could say will also work for uh, F D. Uh, I shouldn't use D, uh, F uh, big D. No, that's diffusion constant. Uh, F, uh, what's a good letter to use? Oh, maybe little D, okay. So this is just any vector space over um, either R or QP. And we're gonna denote um, ambiguously by uh, this absolute value sign, the absolute value in either field. In this case, uh, it's just going to be the uh, a norm on on FD. But here, in this case, we're just going to be looking at QP. And in general, of course, you can be more. You can you can have this as the uh, as the um, uh, as a norm on the on the field, on the on the vector space over the field. So to define a primitive process, you first you, you first define a generator for the primitive process. It's valued in some discrete group. Um, and, and we have xi tilde, this is a sequence of abstractly defined random variables with the same distribution as x tilde. Now, what do I mean by abstractly versus concretely defined random variables? Well, to say it's abstractly defined just means that you, def you don't specify a, um, you don't initially specify a space on which the random variables act or on which the sequence of random variables act. Um, you simply specify the uh, the uh, finite dimensional distributions, um, or the values that this random um, the, the the finite dimensional distributions of the stochastic process. So you so here it's just a single random variable. So you just just specify the distribution of the random variable, um, and uh, and we'll come up with eventually the stochastic process. And what that means is that you just you just you're just uh, 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 d defining this by some um, pre-measures on a, a pi system. That's all you're doing at first. And what you show eventually is, is that this corresponds to an actual um, random variables or stochastic process on uh, some uh, sufficient, some, okay. some space. Oh, a question? No, I, okay, so, 
So for each n, let's denote by s tilde n this abstract random variable given by the sum of these and x tilde the probability that x tilde is equal to zero uh, is equal to one. This just means that the process is starts at zero. Now the abstract process will have a model s and appropriate and an appropriate score hot space, and this will happen in both the real case and the piadic case. Um, and um, uh, and it's important to go to a score hut to, to be in a score hut uh, path space because um, otherwise you can't really do any analysis. Um, the Kolmogorov extension theorem will allow um, very very general classes of of uh, these abstractly defined stochastic processes to um, to be realized as uh, from a concrete model in the space of all paths um, that are valued in FD. Um, but that's too large of a space. Uh, and so there are some theorems that allow you to um, find a version of that path, of that space, of that uh, process in the score hot space of Cadillac functions with under the score hot metric. So the definition um, we'll make now is that a, a sequence of space scales delta is a strictly decreasing positive null sequence, um, delta m, so that delta zero is equal to one. And we take G to be a discrete group, um, as before, a sequence of spatial embeddings of G with scale delta. It's a sequence of injective functions, gamma m, from the group to the field or to FD, uh, satisfying the following properties. Are we okay with this right now? I just want to make sure that we're we're okay with the ideas. We're going to give an example of, and well, the whole talk is really about the examples of this. So, so to simplify the statement of these properties, um, let's just make let's just take dm of G to be the set of points, the image of G under some map under the map gamma m that are a distance of delta m from. Uh, gamma m of g. Now, here are the three conditions. Um, this one is very important. This one's very important. I'm actually not 100% sure about this one. Um, maybe we can talk about that because I'm not 100% not sure if I, if I like this condition um, in general. It automatically holds for um, the processes we're looking at, but in general, I'm just not sure. So for gamma one, for every F in the field or an FD, there is uh, there is a G in G, so that the image of G under the spatial the spatial embedding uh, is delta M close to within delta M close to F. So this just means really that your um, that your image of the discrete group G in the space will eventually fill out space and um, and um, uh, the union of all of the embeddings will be some dense subset. This doesn't require, of course, that uh, that um, the image of gamma m is contained in the image of gamma m plus one. It's not necessary. Um, for every g in g, I'd, so I should say that, yeah, that's fine. So for every g in g, dm of g is non-empty, finite, and the cardinality is independent of g. This is so that the so that the embedded discrete space looks like um, looks like a like, like local uniformity, right? It looks like a grid. Um, though I'm not sure we need this. And gamma of three, I think I'm on the fence. Uh, and gamma three says that for every g and g prime and g. Uh, the points aren't getting too close together. So gamma m of g prime minus gamma m of g is less than delta m. That implies that g prime is equal to g. You, so, you might need finiteness. Oh, this one right here? Yeah, no, 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 in gamma two, you said you might not need this, but do you need finiteness perhaps of dmg? Yeah, you'll need, you'll definitely need finiteness. Um, definitely need finiteness. Um, I haven't used this condition because this condition isn't needed for the examples that we're looking at, but for a general framework, I just don't know yet. 
Um, maybe that will be the next paper. Certainly finiteness seems like we have to have that non-empty. Um, well, that's actually kind of a stupid condition because uh, DM because uh, gamma m of g is in there already, right? So it's not really reasonable. Um, I have to think about this one. I don't know. I'm sure finiteness is necessary. But g is discrete. Does that help somehow? Yeah, but g is infinite. So you could take a lot of that group and just smash it into one piece, right? But you couldn't because of this, actually. So maybe that's automatic. Yeah, it should be automatic. I don't know. No. I was trying to make it look like a grid, and that was the that was the one thing. I think for the current paper, I may just remove that because it might not be necessary for what we have. But for future work, I, I just don't know. Um, so a uh, time scale tau m is a strictly decreasing positive null sequence with tau not equal to one. Um, and a, spa a sequence of spatiotemporal embeddings of n not cross of the natural numbers with zero. Um, this is this natural numbers of zero cross g with time scale tau and spatial temporal and spatial embedding gamma. This is just a sequence of embeddings of or of a function of injections from n naught cross g to zero infinity cross the field or FD um, that takes n to n times tau m and gamma and, and g to gamma m of g. So this is what the spatiotemporal embedding of the, um, of the domain of the initial stochastic processes, the primitive stochastic process. So you embed the space and you, and you embed time, and then you're going to construct a new, uh, a new uh, uh, stochastic process on this space. So now any sequence yoda of spatial temporal embeddings of n not cross g into zero infinity cross f um, with, um, with a scaling, uh, with a time scaling tau and a sp space scaling gamma, um, with I should say time scalings tau and space scalings gamma, introduce, um, introduces uh, a map on the primitive processes in the following way. So you define the abstract process y tilde m as a process with time interval zero infinity uh, and you, you buy, so you um, curry variables to view it like this. So you take, this takes T into Y M T and that's the random variable. It acts in this way. So you see all the probabilities of the, um, the scaled, abstractly defined stochastic process are determined by the, um, the primitive process in this way. Um, so all calculations you need to make about this, you can make using only S tilde. And that was a bit of a change from the original paper. So in the cases we will study bounds on moments guarantee that for each M, Y tilde M has a model with sample spaces in the score hut space. It almost surely take values uh, in the, embedded uh, a discrete space. So notice that this in general, this will always have a group structure inherited by G, but it is not necessarily the group structure um, that is induced by the, um, by the field that in, which, in which it lies. Um, so for each M, define Yoda M of S to be the process um, uh, y m and yoda m remember is the is, is is this process yoda m is the concrete uh, 
version uh, a model uh, for um, uh, for uh, gamma m s tilde floor dot tau m. Oh, you, excuse me, did you say that gamma m is not necessarily a group homomorphism? No, it's not. In fact, in the piadic case, it fails to be a, a, a group uh, homomorphism, um, uh, just barely, but it does. Uh, it fails. Um, and in the, in the, in the, and you can change things in the real case so that you can move points a little bit. And so it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a group homomorphism. Yeah. Um, yep. So you don't you don't really exploit the, any kind of group properties for the for an embedded prop. There aren't there. Aren't, you don't have that. But you don't embed. Uh, um, you don't need to. Uh, you don't need any group processes for the embedded process because all the probabilities are calculated here, or all the calculators are, are all the probabilities are calculated from the um, from the primitive process anyway. So it's here where you, it's really helpful to have a group structure, but it's not, it doesn't matter for the other one, the embedded one. Okay, so a, a measure PM on the cylinder sets of the Skorohut space um, gives rise to the finite dimensional distributions for YM. Uh, and for each M, so the YM, it's a little confusing, I think, because let me just make a little comment here. Well, I have it here. So see, for each M and T, Y, M, T acts, it acts on the space as Y, T, right? See, Y, T is your initial, is the, is the initial diffusion process that we're trying to approximate via a sequence of spatio-temporal spatio embeddings of a, of a primitive discrete time process. But this Y, T, you see, it acts, it takes an omega, and that's in D zero infinity F, this is just a path in the score hearts and the F valued, uh, in the score hot space of F valued paths on zero infinity. It just takes this to omega of T. So it's just evaluation at time T. Well, so on the underlying space, on the underlying set, uh, yt and ytm act the same, but ytm is view this as acting on the space on this on a different probability space. So it acts on the underlying set in the same way, um, but it acts differently on the space because you can you can uh, you can forget the structure of the of the measures, and then uh, ytm under that map that forgets the that structure is just the same function on the underlying set. Um, so really you just have different measures. Um, some measures are coming from a discrete time process and some measures are coming from the continuous time process. Or uh, yeah, they're coming from, the, they're coming from some, um, some, they're still coming from a, a continuous time process, but it's a continuous time process that's given by the discrete time process. So it jumps at specific time points. It doesn't have like um, exponential jump times or anything like that. It's fixed jump times. You jump, you wait a second, you jump again, you wait a second, you jump again. And, and so for appropriate choices of the primitive process and the spatial temporal embeddings, these sequence of measures will converge in the weak star topology on the space of bounded measures on D zero infinity to F uh, to this probability measure P for a Brownian motion on F. And this is in this sense, in this very specific sense, um, discrete time random walks converge to a Brownian motion. And this is a very general sort of framework. So such a sequence of approximating measures, measures exists for any Brownian motion valued in F. Now we have to be very careful about this because um, what do you want to call a diffusion process or a Brownian motion? It certainly doesn't have to be driven by a um, by a 
by you know a uh, a uh, pseudo differential operator. You have much more complicated things, and I say nothing about those more complicated things. In fact, I don't know anything about. I mean, I don't know any relationship between this framework and those things. It would be interesting. I, I just don't know if there's a relationship. But so I'm just looking at the the Brownian motion or the the, the diffusion processes we introduced before, where in the real case it's driven by a um, a uh, you know the diffusion the the, the diffusion equation. Um, um, so it's some constant times the Laplace operator is the, is the infinitesimal generator. And the um, and in the Piatic case, it's a Vladimirov operator. You just replace the Laplace operator by a Vladimirov operator. Now, in this precise sense, Brownian motion, right, in valued in F is a scaling limit of a, pre, of a primitive discrete time random walk. And again, you can be an FD, a little more complicated to know what this should be in the case of F, uh, of, of like a vector space over QP. Um, and, there's, and there are more choices. But in any case, um, um, this should work I'm the same for all of them. Um, but that's not proved. So just to make this concrete, we go back to the setting that we know very well, which is the real setting and where the group, the primitive group is just the integers. Um, so, this is, of course, you know, old, um, and the story goes back to. Uh, I mean, in some sense, it goes all the way back to Demov, but the more the modern theory, um, the convergent, the weak star convergence of measures, you know, goes back to the, the 40s and 50s and early 60s, I guess. Um, uh, so, um, so we take uh, x tilde to be the abstract random variable uh, with the following distribution. You just go, uh, do I have, yeah, I have a picture in a sec. So I'll, I'll wait to do this. So you just move left and right with probability of half. It's important that the mean is zero, otherwise you, in limit, you'll sort of drift into one direction. Um, it doesn't have to be this, and I'll comment on that at the end. Um, let x i tilde be a sequence of independent abstract random variables, each with the same distribution of x tilde, where i varies in n. So the point is, is that you have this generate. So this x tilde, right, is the generator, is the is the generator of the discrete time process. Of the primitive process, I should say. Sorry. Okay, and so x i tilde is a sequence of i i d um, with the same uh, random variables with the same distribution of x tilde. We take x not x tilde x not tilde to be almost surely equal to zero. Again, remember these are the tilde, so these are the these are the abstractly defined random variables. We're just, again, defining them by the, uh, the distribution, by their distribution. And then we can get uh, this abstract random variable, S tilde n. So it fits in the exact, in the, in the framework that we have, um, right? We are trying to follow this as a common framework. And yes, it's exactly what we expect. This is what it looks like, jump jump 50 50 jump jump equal likelihood and you just move along a grid this way okay so what is the what is the spatio temp what is the space embedding I mean, it doesn't have to be this right i get i think um you can shift points a little bit you can do all kinds of things but given any space scale delta m define gamma m for each z in z like this. So you just multiply, this is just a specific example of a spatial of a sequence of spatial embeddings. And so we map z to delta m z. So all we're really doing is, I, I, this is the way I think about it. I think that, so this is the way I think about it. 
if I'm on a grid, like if I'm on the integers and I'm walking this integers, I'm just walking along the integers. I, I, I can jump one to the left one. I, I think I have a, a, a clock and I have a ruler, right? And the clock tells me how much time is passing. The ruler is telling me how far I've gone. But if I only have integer, if I only have, if I'm on the grid, I, I don't know what ruler I'm on. My ruler has a spacing of one and then has another tick mark and then it has another tick mark and it has another tick mark. And it's like, I'm on the integers because even if I decrease the size of the, of the spacing, I have nothing to compare it to. So at any stage of the approximation, I just know that I'm going one to the left or one to the right. I don't have a scale. I can't attach In, internally. I can't attach some kind of scale and know where I am uh, for the time. It's the, it's, it's the same way. I just have tick, 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 tick. The time's ticking forward, um, but I don't know how long I've waited. I just know it's one time tick, two time tick, three time tick, so on. When we embed this, it should be the same thing. So if I embed this in the reals, I've just changed the spacing maybe, instead of this being a distance of one, this is now, and this is a distance of one from that, this is now just one delta, two delta, negative one delta, negative two delta, instead of being uh, one, uh, one tick, a one, I don't know how to say that, um, one uh, tick of the clock, I guess. I just happen to say, well, that's actually one tau seconds. So it's like basically just attaching units to the thing. That's all I'm doing. And that's what a space shown type of betting does. It just attaches units to it. That's what I think that's, that's how I think about a scale. So this is, so given, given the any sp uh, space scale delta M to find gamma M like this, and given a time scale, uh, we then have the embeddings of N naught cross Z into R cross R in this way exactly as in the general setting. This right here is just delta M times Z. Now in each embedding, Yoda M induces a mapping from the process S to index by, uh, to a process that's indexed by continuous time and valued in R. Uh, it's a spatial temporal embedding uh, Yoda M of S. And then we define an abstractly defined random variable like this in the same way as before. Um, the pre-measures defined by YTM on the simple cylinder sets. Um, remember that forms a pi system. Uh, they extend to a measure once again, divided by PM on the cylinder sets. Uh, and this should be F, zero infinity R. So, um, this process YM that acts by evaluation at T is a, is a model for this abstract defined random variable. Um, and, uh, and so we can ask what about the convergence of these embeddings of this process to a Brownian motion? Well, let's denote by EM the expected value with respect to this measure PM and take T1, T, take the, the triple T1, T2, and T3 to be uh, T1, T3, T3 to be an epic. This just means that zero is less than T1, is less than T2, is less than T3. And now this is less than or equal to this. And th that's actually in the real case, it's a very simple calculation. Remember these, are um, uh, these are in are independent, and uh, um, so this will end up being the product of the variances of these increments. The variance of the increments is t two minus t one times t three minus t two. So this is less than or equal to delta m to the fourth. Remember the the space scale comes out here, 
and then it factors out of the uh, expected value. So you get del m squared. Um, so this is um, going to give you the term t2 minus t1 divided by, well, it actually gives you, to be a little more careful, uh, t2, over tau minus t1 over tau floor, which is equal to, sorry, this, which is less than uh, t2 minus t1 over tau, leave. Uh, and there might be some error that goes to, uh, no, I think this works. And then, and then you, then you just, um, then you just, uh, replace the T2 and the T, the T2 and the T1 by T3 and T1 and then T3 and T1 here. And you get this. So this falls out like almost immediately. The, the point is the expected value calculations are very, these are easy to make this calculation. in the R setting. So that calculation is easy to make in the, in the, in the, in the R setting. And this actually um, will automatically give you, uh, well, this gives you um, uh, that the, um, uh, that there's a version of the process YM with sample space, with sample paths and D0 infinity R. Um, uh, we refer to this as, as YM once again, of course, we just ambiguously refer to it like that, so we don't have too many um, symbols. Um, but uh, this, the fact that you have such a process is here follows by a Chensov, the Chensov criterion. So you can do a moment estimate or you can directly estimate the modulus of continuity of the paths. Uh, and it's, it's um, I, I tend to like to work with the moment estimates, but you, you, could, do, you could do either. Um, in this case, it's very easy to work with the moment estimates. It's not the case in the piatics. It's much harder. So we define the spatial and temporal embedding like that. And that's 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 the map we get. And then this is, of course becomes a process, the embedded process in, in, in the score hut space. So now we notice that you end up with this term delta m to the fourth over tau m squared, and we make no assumption. So the m is fixed here. We make no assumption on. We only know that this is a that this is a null sequence and that this is a null sequence. Once you fix M, you know you have a process in the score hut space of um, a model, a version of the of the process in the score hut space. If there is a positive constant D, so the del M squared over tau M tends to D, right? Then this will tend to some constant. Then the estimate given above is uniform in M. And that means that the measures that you have a uniform tightness of the sequence of measures. And the uniform tightness, together with the convergence of the finite dimensional distributions to those of the Wiener measure uh, with diffusion constant D, together imply the weak star convergence of PM to W. And so in that sense, that, and that's, that's what we mean, right, when we say that, the, that, the, um, that we converge, um, the discrete time random walks converge. So you notice that this del M squared over tau M, this is, um, this is the usual relationship between the scaling of, of distance and time in Brownian motion. And that's why, of course, things diffuse in small distances very quickly, but in large distances very slowly. Because del M goes like the square root of tau M. So moves moves a lot when time with small small time changes and move very little with large time changes. So now we go to the piatic process, and it's obviously a bit more complicated. Um, for each m and the natural numbers was was well, so are we okay with this? But right now we're I just want to make sure because before we move on, I want to make sure we're just fine with with this part. Any questions, comments? Objections. 
No, so far so good, David. Great, great, great. So in the piatic case now, what is GM? So we have, so we denote GM, this quotient group. GM is QP mod PM ZP. Um, and we denote by this map, the quotient map from QP onto GM. And we define an absolute value on GM in this way. And, um, and for each equivalence class, for each element in GM, so it's just a quotient map. So this is just, we, we, takes, we define, every, we, we always, I always write everything in terms of a, 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 a representative of an equivalence class, but any calculation we make is, it does not depend on that representative. So for each, we denote the ball of radius. We denote, we denote by this the ball of radius k, and we denote by this the circle of radius k. I mean, it's kind of funny to talk about a boundary, right, <laughs> in the piatics, but th this is the circle of radius, and this is the uh, k, and this is the ball of radius k. So this is what they, both of them are. So the primitive space is the space G0, right? So this is G0. Well, I'll do this. I'll write this down here. G0, which is G, is defined to be QP mod ZP. Okay. And this group, G, is the state space for the primitive process for QP. So the measure mu m on this group gm is just a counting measure that's scaled by a factor of p to the negative m. And we do this so that if you integrate a function over uh, uh, gm, uh, you integ integrate an integrable function over gm with respect to this measure, that it just becomes the sum of um, f evaluated at the xm times p to the negative m. Um, this will mean that this will mean, so the, the importance here is that if you take the schwartz brewer functions with support, so take, if you have, you can map this, you can map the space of schwartz brewer functions on QP to the functions on GM, um, and then, uh, but but then, well, you can make you can actually you map the space of functions on QP uh, to uh, the functions on GM through the by the quotient map. It's just evaluation at at um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, what this gives you is this gives you an isometry between, or this gives you an isometry between the schwartz brewer functions on QP that have a radius of local constancy equal to p to the negative m to the functions on gm. And it gives you an isometry between those two spaces. If you have this counting measure. So this is your, um, this is your state space for a random walk on g. So this is q p q3. And so you start here and you jump out. And so the point is, is how do you, we don't know the probabilities yet, I'll introduce that in a second, but the idea is that you, I sort of view Q, sorry, I view Q3 mod, say in this case, Z3 as a, um, uh, as like an atom, um, or the nucleus is the, is the ring of integers. Um, and and then you jump from energy level to energy level in this atom. So in the 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 discrete, so the the primitive process X will give you the problem will give you the location after one jump. Okay. Uh, and the restriction is is that, once you know that you jump into some circle, 
the probability that you'll be anywhere in that circle, given that you jump to that circle, is uniform. Does that make sense? Yeah. David, could you please show us the previous slide? I, I want to make a comment and a question. The, the previous one. Oh, uh, this one here. OK. Look, uh, 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 David, in terms of applications, the, mm -hmm. the, the point with the group GM is that this group is infinite. Yes. Infinite. In yeah. terms of applications of periodic analysis to, to, to problems in, in the real world, it is necessary to work with a group similar to GM, but it is necessary to truncate. Uh, right now, you are truncating the, the expansion, the periodic expansion, in one side only. Yes. Okay? yes. In, in, yes. In, let's say in the, in the side which is near to, the, to zero. Mm -hmm. We need to truncate, in, in terms of applications, we need to truncate also the the, the 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 pole the part that goes to infinity so yes so we in general we can work with p to the minus m mm -hmm. zp divided by p to the m cp with m positive yes, yes. The, this yes. is we need this this truncation is completely necessary to do numerical simulations absolutely so yes. the, the, the point is can, can you because in terms of, I'm thinking in applications, how to use this yeah. in applications. So it would be possible, or, or have you considered the possibility of a starting with a finite group? Yeah, so, so this is, this is, this is will work. Um, so uh, right now, so I should mention the, the idea behind, and it's, it's a really good question, right? Because in any practical application, you do have to be in a finite space, not just a discrete space. Exactly. For, for a framework, for a framework for, uh, for a finite approximation, the idea is that for theoretical framework, how I wanted to view this is that at every level of approximation, um, at every level of approximation, you, you look the same. So the idea there is for, from the point of, from, from a, a framework point of view, I would like to think about uh, approximation, um, I would like to think that at every level of approximation, you don't know if you were if you were um, if you were attaching distance and time scales, you you simply don't know which level of approximation you are. And so, what this is doing is it, what this is really investigating is is the transition between the discrete and the continuous, which only occurs at the limit. Okay. In practical you, application. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Yes, I understood the part. Yes, yes, because but, but GM practice, is basically the the, the it, it can be identified with the set of natural numbers. Yes, exactly. And so you Please. never and so for every level for every level of approx for every uh, stage of approximation, uh, if you were living in that space and and bouncing around randomly like this, you wouldn't know which approximate you were on. You only know the behavior in the limit. And so this is capturing something fundamental about finite approximation. In practical application, that's of course not good enough. So in practical application, you actually want something finite. The problem is if you have something finite, then you know what level of approximation are because you can count the number of points. Exactly. <laughs> so, so the nice thing though is that these probabilities actually die off extremely fast. So if you want to approximate it, you could do that without any problem. And you would just, you would just change the process a little bit. So what would happen, you do the same thing. I, I could show what we could do with this. So this might be a nice project for us to work on together if you're interested. Um, one could do this. Uh, actually, let me move, oops, sorry. See, you're jumping, you jump from here. I'll show, I'll show you the, uh, the probabilities. Uh, let me see, where do I introduce the probabilities? Don't worry, if you're gonna talk about this later, I can wait. Uh, yeah, so I'll get to that in just about two, two minutes. Yeah. Okay, no problem. I but let's keep, we should definitely keep that in mind because yes, that's absolutely 100% correct. Yeah. At this point, it's not usable. And in fact, it's actually really hard to do, the space gets big very fast. So it's actually hard to do calculations. Um, so we denote by 
alpha M, the group, this group isomorphism. Now, how does alpha M? Alpha M takes you from G to GM in this way. And the mappings from the GM to QP permit the alpha M to be viewed as maps that refine the space. So you can really think about these alpha M's as just refining the space, which you know, it really is doing. You take the, this equivalence class and you map X to PMX, and then you just take a smaller um, ball. So that's what, you, that's what this is. Uh, the group P to the negative MZP is the Pontryagin dual of GM. And any element of GM is, uh, looks like bracket XM for some X and QP. The canonical inclusion map takes the Pontryagin dual um, um, to the uh, to, uh, QP. Um, and uh, it permits any Y in, in the Pontryagin dual to be viewed as an element of QP. It's just the inclusion map, the canonical inclusion. Uh, and you can define a, tool, a, a dual pairing from the Pontryagin dual and uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the Cartesian product of the Pontryagin dual, a dual of GM and GM um, in, in this way, which is just, this is just the usual character. Uh, sorry, my handwriting is falling apart. On, uh, on QP. Um, and, uh, you know, defined by the exponentiation of the truncation. So while the, definite, while the definition of the dual pairing uses a specific representative of the equivalence class, this is independent of the representative, which is, which is you know, easy to prove. So you have uh, a character, you have uh, a Fourier transform, you can do Fourier analysis on the GM, um, and, uh, and it, um, so this allows us to make these calculations, um, uh, take Fourier transforms of the probability density function to get a characteristic function and so on. Uh, and uh, now we have to embed, uh, um, we want to be able to embed the GM into QP and we simply take, so for each Z and GM, you take X and QP so that Z is equal to, um, um, there is an X and QP so that Z is equal to the, uh, the quote, uh, the, the, um, uh, the bracket X, uh, the, the, the equivalence uh, uh, class. Equivalence class, thank you. <laughs> I can't think of words, thank you. The equivalence class uh, in, which X, uh, in which X lives. And so, uh, uh, so uh, we pick for each Z uh, a particular X, and we denote that by this. Now, I mean that's there are lots of possibilities, um, but once you pick one, this map is an inclusion, and it doesn't matter which one you pick. You can pick any one you like. So it doesn't matter how you embed it, or how you how you embed GM into the QP, as long as you just take some equivalence class, uh, some some representative of the equivalence class. So there are many possible sequences of these injections. Um, we're going to choose some JM that truncates a representative of an element of GM to the mth place. And so we define that to be our spatial temporal embedding. So we, we first refine, and then we, and then we um, uh, pick a spe specific equivalence class. The one we choose will just be the truncation. Um, and... Uh, um, um, and there's no reason to do it. It makes calculations a little bit easier, but it, it doesn't make any difference. And so the sequence of grids is a sequence of refinements that approximates QP uh, in the sense, uh, now in this sense, the nice thing is, is that the, the nice thing if he, about this is your gamma M of G in this case actually is contained in your gamma m plus one of g. So it just makes it easier to work with. And your gamma infinity of g uh, is, uh, is the, the union of all these and, um, and is dense. Um, again, it doesn't have to be like this. So for any finite sequence, um, it turns out that gamma m of the sum of these gi's is just equal to p to the negative m times the sum of the g. And this is really nice because then it makes it easy to compute using the um, using the primitive process. So 
here's the point though. The point is when we visual, we'll talk about the, uh, the actual probabilities and the process a little more. So if you visualize G as this atom given by two, you view each PN as a principal energy level. And these elements as a particular state having the principal quantum number given by that shell, the energy level at shell. And the primitive random walk really describes a particle that's moving between electron states, this atom. And so I, that's, that's in the sense that the discrete time random walk is an exploration in, a, in an energy landscape, in a discrete energy landscape, uh, where each with, that has uh, uh, finitely many states at each, uh, at each level. So this is a very convenient way of defining the probabilities. The probability that you jump a distance and one, this is just one jump, remember, this is just one jump. This is the primitive process, so you just jump once. The probability that you jump to the energy level pi is one over p to the ib times some constant, and we choose that constant so that the probability that you stay in the at the uh, at the nucleus or at the at the at the uh, uh, at zero is zero. So you're always jumping. This is a little bit different than the process we defined before in, in the previous paper. Um, it, it doesn't. It, the point is, it's not going to matter at all what this is. <laughs> but we haven't proved that. But I just came up with a proof, actually. I haven't published it yet, but I just came up with a proof of that. There's some, some technical details to work out, but there's an invariance principle here. So it doesn't matter what the probability is. This is just a convenient one to pick because it's easy to work with. Well, easier to work with. So X tilde has a law, and that's important, by the way, right? That's important because it's like in the reals, you have these collisions, right? Uh, but you don't have to have half and half. It doesn't matter what it is, so long as it's mean free. And finite variance. And then, and then when you scale properly, you get a Brownian motion with some diffusion constant. The same thing happens here. So, so there's a, there's a rigidity, right? It's, you can't just, you don't just get anything. Uh, from random walks. So note that X tilde has a law that is different from, from this one, uh, from the one previously in the uh, Eric Bakken and my CMP article. Uh, it generates, uh, it's different, but it still generates the abstract pr uh, process in the same, it, it still abstract, it gives you the abstract process. It's a little different, qualitatively different, because that now the particle that, uh, that jumps with full probability, uh, jumps with full probability step, and it defines a law for any B and any prime P. It was not the case earlier. Um, we, we didn't have a law that was uh, worked that worked that nicely. Um, we had to have B bigger than one, actually. So um, no, we had to, yeah, yeah. So in any case, the the key here is that now this is where we get to this issue of what if we wanted a finite finite uh, approximation, not a discrete approximation. What you could do is you could just change these probabilities a little bit. You could sit here a little bit longer and then truncate that. And you notice that this is going down like one over P to the IB. So as long as B is not too small, um, those probabilities get small very, very fast. And so, you end up um, having, I think, very good, appro I mean, we haven't done this, but you should, you, you will end up um, getting very good approximations for the Brownian motion. And you just have to see how, how good the, the approximations are, but you should be able to approximate finitely um, uh, to a very high degree of accuracy um, with reasonably small cutoffs. That's my expectation. But that's not proved yet. But it should be usable, right? Because it's it's a it's decreasing like one over p. I mean, if p is large and it's really fast, but even if p is two, it's still going to just. Uh, David, sorry, a question about mm -hmm. this. I'm trying to to think in terms of equations or differential equations. So, if this probability, uh, this prop of x tilde, is a probability measure in GM. So if it's a probability measure in the end, we can use the Bogner theorem. So the Fourier transform is gonna give you exponential of something and 
and, and, and inside of the exponential, you can get a symbol for a, a true differential operator. I see. So could you, could you, I see. So could you view the discrete time process as coming from? For, from some period, I'm trying to understand in terms of, because this is important for physics. I mean, your, your, your suggestion that these uh, jumpings can be visualized as a kind of a, a non-Archimedean atom, this is quite interesting for me. But I, I would like to understand, and I would like to know if there is a kind of equation behind all this model, okay? This is extremely important. So I'm trying to, to see if, if we can have the equation, but if this is a probability measure, the Fourier transform should the exponential of a positive, of the so it's, positive yeah. definite of negative function, and you can use this to define, okay, let, let, okay, you have this result. Yeah, okay. so, it, so you can, so yeah, so, so that's actually a really good point. What happens is, so to work with these probabilities mm -hmm. uh, and to get the process, we, we, so we, we develop, so this is the X tilde. The first uh -huh. thing we want to do is Fourier transform the okay. probability density function. And then you get this when you Fourier transform it. So this almost looks, so when you scale that, you start to look like an exponential because when you scale this, so we now, we now add up the processes. We add up the, the each, a bunch of jumps. Mm -hmm. So this adds up just as before, it adds up a bunch of jumps. And then we end up with a new probability density function for that, that process. And now we can compute that probability density function. How do we compute that probability density function? Well, the idea is that you Fourier transform the, um, and that's in the M space, the, um, the uh, x tilde to the power n. Uh, and this is, we'd have to, um, I'll put an M up here. So you have to take this, this, uh, we have to take this characteristic function you map now over to the GM. So you get something analogous in the GM. You take that to the nth power, and then you take the inverse Fourier transform of that. Mm -hmm. And that's how you calculate. And it ends up, I, I think I have it written here. Um, uh, let me see if I have it written here in the notes. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll skip some slides because we don't need to go to the details. Uh, let me mention one thing first, is that when you, calculate the ex when you calculate the expected value of the primitive process, this is the primitive process, you end up with this inequality. Now, this is the hardest part of the, uh, uh, this is the hardest calculation made in the paper, um, where you actually have to calculate this moment. And it's a very fine estimate. You need to make sure that it's K times N to the R over B. And this will give you the uniform estimates on the moments uh, of the embedded processes. Uh, basically how you get this is you turn this, you, you calculate this, this becomes some infinite sum. And that infinite sum ends up being a, um, a Riemann sum approximation of a beta function. And then you end up, and then you approximate that with some quotient of gamma functions, and you end up with this coming out at the end. So it's it's a fine estimate, and it's but it 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 it's a difficult estimate to make, but it you get this, uh, and and it's nice because all the calculation, this calculation is only right. It's just it's just a calculation for the. I shouldn't say it's nice. It it's simpler than the calculations we made before because. It's only made, this is only involves the primitive process. When you scale the primitive process, you automatically get the right scaling here. So all, everything is done only in that primitive process. Um, here is your diffusion equation in your piatic case. I include the diffusion constant. Uh, this is the fundamental solution, which is of course well known. Now, this is so, so Wilson, this is what you're talking about. When you look at the characteristic function, right, for the 
for the mth approximant, that is the characteristic function. And that looks an awful lot like a, um, this looks an awful lot like a, an exponential um, because um, uh, well, you, well, you'll see here. Uh, let me write down what I have. Yes. Remember, this is this is the characteristic function for just one jump, for just the for just the generator. But when you when you look at the characteristic function uh, for s n m, which is the embedded stochastic process at the nth time step, then you take a product to the n. And if n looks something like p to the mb, right, then you get something that starts looking like an exponential, 1 minus 1 over n to the n. And so the, it'll, it'll be like an exponential to the power yb. See, so what comes out of here is this. So if this is the uh, embedded this is now the, um, the uh, characteristic function associated to the, uh, the abstract process, continuous time process. It's the abstract um, process. And this starts looking awfully like an exponential. And you take the Fourier transform of that. Well, so this is this, uh, right? So, this is the uh, the um, the characteristic function. Then, when you embed it, so here y is in p to the negative m z p. But when you embed that into q p, then that becomes a character. That becomes like the characteristic. It's not the characteristic function, but this becomes because it's, it's yeah, this is the this is the sort of uh, uh, um, um, quantity. This is the function. That's embedded now. That, that's the that's the uh, this function. You map this function over to a function on QP, and it's so you have a natural cutoff. And now this guy uh, converges uniformly to e to the negative t sigma y to the b. And this gives you a real indication immediately that you should be um, uh, that you should be um, approximating um, the uh, the continuous time process, which you are. Sorry. So I didn't, but, but, but I didn't, but this doesn't answer your question. No, no, but it seems this suggests, this suggests mm -hmm. that, it's, that it is possible to construct some, a kind of pseudo differential discrete versions for your stochastic processes. Because look, in this, the, 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 um, the absolute value of B raised to B, this is the symbol that we need. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I think, I, yeah, I, I'm sure you're right. But this is interesting in terms of physical interpretation. Ah. Yes, this is fundamental. If we can, if these uh, discrete approximations, if you can attach a kind of differential or two differential equation to these discrete approximations, this is interesting in terms of physics. Because now right, you're well, it won't be, so it won't be a differential equation. No, it no, won't be a I'm thinking, yeah, I'm giving just a name, an yeah, equation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, a differential equation involving a, a kind of differential equation involving time and position. The time yeah, should be, be yes. real, but the position is a variable in a discrete space. And you need yeah. a, and, and you need an operator, yes. a kind of pseudo differential operator in this discrete space. Well, it's, in, it's interesting because it kind of mixes this this. Uh, it kind of mixes like the the uh, we well, kind of expect this in the piatics that you have a kind of mix mixing between discrete and continuous features. Uh, and that and, happens. And, 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 yeah, and, and so here, so in the, in the real case, in the, in, the, in the real case, right, in the finite approximations, you have a difference equation rather than a differential equation that the process satisfies. Uh -huh. uh, in the piatic case, you still have, in, in the, for, the, for the limiting process, for the diffusion, you still have a differential part in time but in space, it's now no longer differential. It's now pseudo differential operator. Exactly. But in the discrete version of that, you'll still maintain the pseudo differential operator for the space part, but now it'll be a difference equation for the time part. Yes. Yeah. 
So it, it would be good. It would be good to to know this situation in explicit form because this can give you some physical insight of, of your model. Right. It also be interesting to measure. So for your, for the point of view of a uh, of, of finite approximation, finite approximation, it'd be really important to know the exit times for this process. Okay. Right, because if you know that with almost zero probability you exit a ball of a certain size, then you might as well just condition to be in that ball. Okay. So there, I think there are two interesting things to think about right, right there, right? right your, your idea of, the, of, the, of finding the operator, which I think is a really neat idea, I didn't think about that. And then the other one is to actually calculate exit, estimate exit times. Because if we have, if we have, if we, have estimates for the exit times for this process, and we know that you know that it's just you know one and one over ten to the two hundred chance, right, of, of of leaving a ball of uh, some reasonable radius, um, which might actually happen. Um, then um, I mean, which might actually be the case that it's very very small. I think it will be very small. Um, then um, then yeah then then it's perfectly reasonable to find out the approximate you won't know the difference anyway and so we can just truncate and maybe make maybe make it a little bit more likely to stay at the uh, at the at the origin um, and then uh, and then or just change the probabilities a little bit so that that, that scale it differently so that you can you only need finitely many of them um, and you have to be a little bit careful with the finite approximation because um, you can't any you have to always allow yourself to jump infinitely far on a single jump if you take limits. Because if you only jump finitely far when you scale, you, can, you have to stay in that finite ball, but you're scaling by, uh, you're, you're scaling space so that things are getting closer and closer and closer together. Uh, so if you have a process that doesn't jump infinitely far initially, then the limiting process will just stay at the origin and never move. But that's okay for us because we're not worried about the limiting behavior. We're just finally approximating. And then, you can, and then you can certainly just truncate to a single ball because you're not taking the limit. You're only just cutting it, you're cutting it off. So I think, I think that those are both totally reasonable um, directions. And then you can actually use this to finally approximate um, to find out the or to just yeah to find out the approximate Brownian motion. I think that's important, right? Because because if you have, if you want to use anything, I mean, this is what this is what prompted the study in the in the beginning was the idea that I, I wanted to study um, Brownian epiotic Brownian motion better. But I, I just found I, I couldn't I didn't have any intuition about it. Um, and I noticed that, in, I mean, quite honestly, when I read the articles on it, when I read what was written what was written about it, I, it was just. It was clear to me that everyone was just a lot smarter than I was, and I couldn't, I couldn't get, I couldn't get the intuition that everyone else seemed to have. So I thought, well, I have to make it easy, for, easier for me. I, I, I tend to think discreetly about things, so let's come up. Maybe I can come up with a, Maybe we can come up with a model that is a discrete time random walk so that I can discount. And if I can discount, then I can understand it. And uh, and and already it has that sense of it. So I I should mention what the new result, what the new actual convergence results are. Because if it was just about a new finite approximation, well, we already did that in, in the CMP paper, right? And I'm kind of curious to know what you think about this. I'm not kind of, I'm very curious to know what you think about this. Because before, so there's an advantage. I claim that there's an advantage to doing things in this way. So first of all, the cal this is the primary calculation one, wants, one needs to make in order to show uniform tightness of the measures and then the convergence of the distribution. So this is really the key estimate. And in the previous paper, um, it, you know, it was hard and it required lots of estimates to make this and, and there was just a lot of trial and error. In this, there wasn't. In this, I mean, you can sit down and, you know, the other one, if you lock me in a room and said, uh, and said, rederive the results of the previous paper, uh, I'd probably starve <laughs> to death, right? I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to do that. But if you ask me to do this one, there's a very good reason why it should be this. And so it's something that, you know, I wouldn't, maybe it would take me more than a day, but I certainly wouldn't starve. Like I know exactly why it's true. 
In fact, I probably, well, right now after the talk, I could probably do it off the top of my head. So it's not hard to do that because you have a reason why it's true. And so that was one thing that was attractive to me about the new approach. But I don't think that that's enough. So actually what you get out of this is you get a much stronger approach. Uh, we get a much stronger result. So in the new work, and, and the, this is on the archive in 2020, but I, I need to um, um, submit it. Um, I'm just editing it um, this week and hopefully I'll submit it this weekend. But there's a sequence in this new work, there's a sequence of measures, right? So that this triple is a model and it's uniformly tight. That's great. So here, let's see, uh, let me get the main result. The main result is this. If you have time and scale, uh, time and space scaling, uh, let me just give you the result. Yeah, if you have, this is the main result then. If you have time and scaling, time and space scale scaling like this, which is exactly analogous to the real setting, right? This B is two. And this is the same result we found in the original paper. So if this is a scaling, then uh, you get a weak star convergence to the associated measures on the past space. But the current paper B had to be in one infinity, not zero infinity. And you only get weak star convergence for a fixed positive time. So here, uh, weak star convergence of D zero infinity, uh, zero T QP uh, to D, uh, uh, um, um, sorry, weak star convergence in in the space of bounded measures on this space and for fixed T. But now not only can we extend B to be zero to infinity, we actually get a um, weak star convergence on, uh, we get weak star convergence on D zero infinity QP. So it's a kind of uniformity. Uh, and the reason why is because our, our, our estimate for the moments is a uniform estimate in, it doesn't require T to be fixed. And so that's, so we, so the result is, I think significantly stronger because it allows for all B. It's also significantly stronger because you have weak star convergence and in this infinite time interval rather than a compact time intervals. Uh, and then the approach uh, is actually um, well motivated. Um, the estimates are well motivated now when they weren't before. But yeah, I think that the I, I like I really like this idea of trunc of truncating, and then looking also at the operators is two different two different ways forward with it. I think that's a great idea. I mean, what is your sense of 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 the, of the, of the, of the, I think it's an important mathematical improvement. So in terms of a publication in, mm -hmm. in a mathematical journal, this is relevant, okay? Because right. you have a, 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 your mathematical result is better. Now, yeah. in terms of, of a publication in a journal in mathematical physics, the situation, it is not clear, you, you know, because uh, the, the question is in terms of physics, uh, how you can, uh, what interpretation, uh, what time of new interpretation you get from this new result? And probably it's, it's difficult to get a new physical interpretation, something new. But in terms of mathematics, yeah. it's good. So I suggest look for, for, mathematics. for a journal a mathematics. in mathematics, in probability, yeah, yeah. probably. <laughs> that's and what, not that's a journal what I mean. in mathematical physics. Yeah, that's what I was, I was thinking. I was thinking probably more like a mathematics journal than a mathematical physics journal because, because it's more of a mathematical result. Um, but there's one difference is that you can now integrate, you could now integrate uh, functionals uh, over the entire space that depend on non, that depend on all time rather than depend on just, but again, you know, do you ever work with something that has all time in a physical setting? Yeah. Let me tell you something, David, there is a new journal 
the, the, this new journal is called Probability and Mathematical Physics of Probability and Physics. I don't know if, 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 you, if I don't know. you saw this journal. Know. This is a very good journal. This is a new journal. I mean, the, the, the editorial board is extremely strong. I mean, these guys are extremely strong, strong probability and physics. But this is a new journal. So this means that this journal doesn't appear in the databases of the journal citation report, something like that. But this journal is extremely strong. So it's probability okay. and physics. Yes, uh, it, this is a new journal, probability and physics. Journal and probability. This is a new journal. It's an electronic journal. If you don't have any restrictions with with the journal, this this could be a good a good choice for you, because mm -hmm. this is very this journal. I mean, the, the board the editorial board is very strong in terms of mathematics, but. They are interested also in, I mean, this journal is also interested in connection with physics. Ah, very nice. I haven't heard. I, 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 this is just... new. This is a new, probably two or three years or five years. Ah, I mean, this is a very new journal. That's great. That, that, sounds, that sounds great. Yeah, and, and, and I think, I think what I, I'd like to, it'd be interesting to push this, the, the whole thing forward to, you know, to study, like you say, the, uh, the, the operator itself and then the, and then and actually get to make it usable yeah you have to you have to have it, it has to be a finite approximation so yes. it, i think it, i think it just ends up being getting error bounds on on the difference between and getting error bounds on the difference between the finite approximation and the discrete approximation because once you know the you know the discrete approximation converges then it's just it's just a matter but you have to get error anyway we still have to get error bounds on the on the discrete approximation on the finite approximate, I mean, on the on the discrete approximate. Yeah, so, so here, this doesn't involve. There are no error. There are no actual error bounds yet established. So we need to get error bounds on the discrete approximation, and then get error bounds on the finite approximation to the discrete approximation, and then and then then it can actually be used. But right now, it's it's a purely theoretical result. Yes, it, it, it would be also interesting to have samples of this stochastic process, of the discrete version. Yeah, this is fundamental for application, you know, because in all the books about Brownian motion, you see the, you see visualizations of Brownian motion, okay? So here in, the, in this chaotic framework, it would be extremely important yeah. to see a kind of visualization of this, of the discrete version of, the, of this, of this uh, chaotic Brownian motion. Yeah, I've always wanted to see. I've always wanted to see the simulation of. of there was, I think, I think, I believe Avetisov has a has. I remember when we were in Moscow years ago. Uh, yeah, but they, they don't he, have. Uh, they, they they did something, but they, this is an open problem. This yeah. is still an open problem. To actually see, to actually visualize it. To visualize it. Yeah. Yeah. The solution. Well, I think part of the, part of the problem with the visualization, right, is because. Up until now, there hasn't been a discrete time progress process that you could use to plug into a computer to visualize it. <laughs> so you have to have a discrete time process to start with. Okay, Patrick, uh, sorry, David, thank you very much for your talk. It was a very nice talk. Okay. I don't have further comments. Uh, I want to ask the audience, the, the, the other participants, if, if, if you have comments or questions for David. Okay, David. Okay, thank okay, you okay. very much. Thank, thank you very much. I'll, 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 maybe we can be talk a little bit about the other. Sure, sure. Yeah, man. Love, you, you send me an email, and we can, you know, talk to, okay. to Zoom about this. I, I'm very interested in, on these matters, but right now, I think, I think that it is extremely important to show practical applications of, of the theoretic analysis. I mean, it, because. You know the publication of certain results of certain uh, pure results in, in, in periodic analysis can be difficult because this analysis is quite technical, mm -hmm. and then the paper is addressed to a small audience, and the editors right now most of the editors are not interested in this type of papers. Most of the right. editors are, 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 are most of, most of the journals. Uh, 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 are interested in, in, in papers for a general audience, you see? Right, right. So it is necessary to show to, to the general public that these ideas 
are relevant in terms of application. And then, of course, the, the, the need for pure results will, will, will appear natural. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it, 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 right, it's interesting because it's interesting because special results like this, it's technical results from the probability side. And then it's also technical results from the piatic side. So you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're taking the intersection of, of, of audiences. <laughs> It's and this is technical, large. and this is technical. So they, they you, as, because you are taking an intersection of two audiences, you get a, a smaller audience. Yeah. Let me stop recording.